This is episode number 586 of the Inner Fight Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the show, folks. And this one, you are absolutely going to love. It's all about nutrition, food, fueling your bodies. And actually, we jump into some quite interesting information about sourcing of different ingredients and things that you guys need to look out for. But of course, as always, talking about nutrition, a big shout out to our show sponsors, Smith Street Paleo. Do hop over smithstreetpaleo.com, check out the recipes, mail them hello at smithstreetpaleo.com and learn all about the different food plans that they have. Loads of different options. You can get food delivered to your house or office or wherever really. Give them a shout. They'd love to hear from you. As I said there, yes, today's show is with the founder of Secret Training, a gentleman by the name of Tim Lawson, who has an incredible background in sports performance and in fueling athletes himself, a very keen cyclist, so he knows exactly what he needs and when he needs it. In this show, Tom gets, uh, Tim gets quite technical with different things and then we try and loop it back to how it will apply to you guys but a load of knowledge and some really interesting things so stick with us through the more technical parts we do get to some really interesting parts as well i think it's actually all super interesting if you want to know how to fuel your body better you just have to focus for the next 45 minutes and this is a really interesting show tom joins me as we talk to tim lawson about secret training and about fueling your bodies for performance and really a little bit for life. No matter where you are in the world, thanks a lot for tuning into the show. If you do enjoy the show, please rate and review it or just share it with a friend if you think it might help them. I would really, really appreciate that. Let's get into today's show. Welcome back to another edition of the show, folks. And as I was saying there, this is probably a topic that everyone wants to hear about, listen to and ask a million questions about. Walker's here. Good morning, Walker. Hello. Hey, Hello. you're looking very thin. Ready for the race on the weekend? Ready, race ready, yeah. Race ready. Current weight? Uh, non-disclosed. Oh, wow. That's a bit bitchy, isn't it? <laughs> uh, doesn't want to tell us how much he weighs. But, mate, big race this weekend, and you'll obviously be using what we're going to be talking about here, a lot of secret training race nutrition. Only secret training race nutrition, yes. Mate, I want to kick off, before we, before we bring this legend into the show, I want to kick off with a little bit of your background on secret training and your experience with it, because you're actually the one that got spoke, started speaking to me about it initially. Tell us. Yeah. I, we had Tim in on a Sunday and I think I introduced him with this story but on a very rainy Ironman Bolton which I think was 2015 or 2014 I was stood on the stand of the bike shop I was working for at the time and uh, we always had different people would come up at, at different races in the year and, and Ironman Bolton was a, was a big one because it's the UK champs and they come up with different products they want you to try and this is the latest gel on the market and this is the one you want and this one is better than that one and they could never say why they could just tell you it's better because they get more margin on it yeah and so i remember tim came up and was i had secret training Similar on a sales pitch and uh <laughs> you know he was saying oh, i can see you're selling we were selling uh talk talk gels and he said have you have you tried you should try what we do and and at the time i was actually on a a bit of a low carb kick i think oh and uh, keto life yeah i was I like <laughs> thinking about this keto business and <laughs> I said, uh, I said oh, I'm really starting to get more and more against these sugary gels. I think people, you know, they're just all about flavors and people don't want to take it because they don't like the flavor of it. I was like, it's all about more performance side of things. And, and Tim just started talking at me about what they do with their sticky rice starch and yeah. fruit, uh, fruit purees and how their gels are different and how it sits nicer on the stomach. And, and I'm just standing there like, whoa, sold. Okay. <laughs> and then he goes, wait here a minute. So waited and, and off he went, returned back with a a big cardboard box and, and said there you go have a month's supply and try it out let wow. me know what you think and it was the time they were non-branded planting products on the <laughs> weakest guy in the room <laughs> they, were, they were unbranded sachets so they were yeah. just foil and he said um right these are these ones and i think that's that and uh he said these ones are mct oil there are mct gels right and i thought Okay, interesting. I've been using MCT a little bit because yeah. obviously when you go into more of a, a keto state, yep. everyone goes down the MCT train and decides how much is enough to shit themselves. And how <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely true. And I thought, okay, this guy knows knows things. Yeah. And uh, pretty much, yeah, tried out the products, loved them, um, stopped getting the GI distress that I was getting. Yeah. And then we uh, we started working with with the bike <laughs> shop I was working for we started selling it in the shop and as with anything once you get behind a product that you use yourself and believe in 
it becomes something very easy to, to t t tell, give to other people. So I used them in the UK for three or four years, did um, a crude race across America where the guys only use secret training. And uh, so it was good to see the product again working not just on myself but on on riders who are riding six days super hard all the way across america like yeah. it's, it's clearly a proven it's a good product yeah then i moved out here and the product wasn't here and it was sort of oh no like gonna have to pay quite a lot shipping wise getting it out and yeah. literally after like a month or so of being here i met david who's the distributor for it here now and he said oh, i'm getting secret training over wow couldn't believe my luck and uh, uh. that was it well, let's get him. Let's talk to him. Here he is, Tim Lawson, mate. Cardboard boxes, sachets. It sounds like the, the U.S. Postal Service drug scandal all over again, mate. Is that really how it started? Yeah, I was often been uh, somewhat nervous taking unbranded, plain uh, bags of white powder through the customs <laughs> yeah. or, or um, to uh, athletes on uh, motorway service stations and say, "There you go, mate. Uh, try that." Yeah. Um, but. Um, you got to try. You got to try things. Um, yeah. Keep that close to there. Then we can hear you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, you've got to. You've got to um, use every opportunity to um, test things before you try and launch them to, yeah. to market and check that they work in real life. So, with uh, someone that um, <laughs> comes along and says they're, they're they're doing those kind of events, you say, yeah. well, try this. Let's see how Let's we get see on. see how it goes. Yeah. Give us a bit of a background, mate, on how you got into sports nutrition. and Because I know a lot of people maybe know you from, from a previous brand. I won't mention it. You can if you want to. Totally up to you. But where did all of this maybe obsession with sports nutrition start? I suppose that goes way back to... Um, I've always been a, a cyclist. It's been my thing um, back in the UK in the Ribble Valley Cycle Racing Club. Um, and I went away and studied sports science before really anyone did sports science, put right. on the, the first courses in the, in the UK. Yeah. Um, really trying to find out how I could ride my bike a little bit faster. Right. Maybe, maybe there's a secret out there. Yeah. Um, it's probably fair to, to be fair to be said, I, I, um, I'm not sure whether I found the secrets or didn't necessarily apply them that well <laughs> uh, at, at that time. Um, and after I graduated in sports science, there wasn't the, the, the careers and the jobs that there are in sports science and sports nutrition that, that there are now. Yeah. But it, it was really a research. They, they trained us to do research into sports science, exercise physiology. Right. Always interested in nutrition. Um, and I know I went to work for the pharmaceutical industry afterwards. There was more money in that, in that uh, yeah. uh, back then. And, uh, but whenever we went out on a club run on a cycle ride, if we stopped at a cafe, people would say, oh, come on, Tim, you're a sports scientist. Tell us what we should be eating. Right. So I, I kind of got fed up in the end of doing lectures on the backs of serviettes every time we went <laughs> on a bike ride and said, why don't you? I come to the club, I do a talk on sports nutrition. Yeah. Um, I give you the background and then you can leave me alone to eat my burgers or whatever because, <laughs> again, I wasn't always good at applying the, the theory. Um, but the, what happened then is if you went to the club and you did a good talk yeah. and then you get passed on to the other club and then the other club and you oh, we found ourselves on the lecture circuit here right. and we'd be recommended different products and strategies and sometimes you, if you went back you'd get a whole load of feedback you know on these products and you'd be thinking well should that really happen you know I'm looking at the research and looking at the products and say well that should perform better than that yeah um, could we not reconcile this good honest feedback with the scientific information that's out there and maybe come up with something that's a little bit better. Yeah, right. So, you know, stopped my dad from retiring. Um, or oh, he took early retirement, stopped him disappearing off to the south of France or something and said, well, you know, you can help us with this. Uh, fund uh, this. Uh, yeah, yeah, fund <laughs> this. Um, and pulled my brother in and, and we set off and we set up our, our, our first sports nutrition business. Right. We built that nutrition business up really trying to do that to try and reconcile the, the scientific research with the the feedback and trying to you know what i was thinking was often you see back then and you see it now you see um a lot of professional guys waving the flag for a particular nutrition brand or or pop soda yeah uh, whereas in the background what they're really using is something quite different something, yeah and yeah, um, yeah. the you know, back then the the theory was Surely there's enough people uh, that are interested will maybe pay a little bit more to get the real deal. 
and all we need to do is, is kind of sell the truth or yeah, right. do you know what I mean just explain yeah. things rather than sell things yeah um, and we did that we built that that company up to um, a significant uh, business um, which was a family f folks getting on brothers maybe wanting to take things in different directions uh, in the end it became easier to to sell that that, that, that business yeah. um, which we did um, but it's not like I was not going to have an interest in sports nutrition and exercise performance yeah. just because um, we'd sold our, our old business so I went back to our local university and did another master's degree another uh, master's degree just to um, <laughs> as you do <laughs> to, well mainly to get access to the labs in the library cheeky <laughs> well do you know I, I made full use of it, about it as well. you yeah. know when they, they, okay. whenever you go on the course they say spend time in the library well when I went back that time I really made full use of the library <laughs> And some of it was relevant to the questions I was meant to be answering for the some course I was studying. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, a lot of it was more to do with, well, that looks interesting. Um, and that's th and that uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, I think the um, you know the sticky rice starch. Why why sticky yeah. rice starch? Yeah. And um, what we'd seen is that there was um, there's quite a lot of research where people have tried to improve upon the. World Health Organization guidelines for oral rehydration solutions, you know, standard, right. the super oral rehydration solutions. And all kinds of theories and not much works, but the sticky rice starch based beverages seem to offer an advantage. And if you reconcile that with in the pro tour cycling, you see many of the cycle teams have moved away from bread to sticky rice cakes. Yeah. So okay, so there's this research in um, or super oral rehydration solutions. There's practice out there, but no one's really done this in in real life. Maybe that was a, so. That was kind of thing. We'd looked at things that, that maybe maybe we could do a technical product with sticky rice starch. When we came to do it, actually, it was a little bit more. There were reasons why it were, maybe no one had done it before because <laughs> it um, became a, yeah processing that was quite interesting. Yeah. So um, I went away and, and did that. We had a non-compete for three years. Um, when the Tour de France came to Yorkshire, though, we bumped into the guys from Tinkoff Saxo. What year was that? I can't, rem I can't remember now. But, um, <laughs> it was like 2015, wasn't it? Oh, that sounds about right. I think it was the time you were launching cardboard boxes out of things. Right, okay. So probably yeah, why it was unbranded. And yeah, so you know, we yeah. did, if you were experimenting with a few things, but... Um, the, tinker, the final push to get into sports nutrition was really the, the Tinkoff Saxo guys. Um, they had a, a, a partner for hydration and they were quite happy with that. But they were saying, Tim, could you help us with a, a better energy gel? And I thought, well, we've got some ideas. We made full <laughs> use of the library on that um, of course I was doing. Um, Loads of cardboard my, boxes. <laughs> my my brother-in-law set up a little production unit where he's been, been doing a little bit of experiments and things. Um, let's see if we can... Um, well, so the idea was that a little project on gels that'll keep us off the streets. We'll just do gels; that'll be that'll be, that'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so we thought, well, most of the professional riders and the serious athletes will recognise the benefit of a, an isotonic energy gel. So when the pressure's down, separate, you can take an isotonic energy gel easy on your stomach. Yeah. Um, but the the other way to make an isotonic energy gel has been with an artificial sweetener for people to, you know. You could make it without, I guess, but people wouldn't want to uh, eat it. Eat yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the idea was, well, maybe we could make um, an energy gel if we use a little bit of uh, sticky rice starch. It's a bigger molecule, make up uh, space to be able to then include fructose. Then we'd be able to make uh, an isotonic energy gel without an artificial sweetener and with multiple transportable carbohydrates. So there would be... Um, technical improvements and no downside of using artificial sweeteners which if you could do it without then you probably should yeah right so well then having done a uh, an energy gel so then it's well well actually tim what about hydration <laughs> <laughs> i think well we've got some ideas um <coughs> but now we have to put a powder line in okay um so we 
put some uh, formulations together for hydration and having done that then it was uh well what about recovery wow so i don't know when you start buying pallets of protein powder do we um so yeah and then uh, and then i think the somebody the, the the gap as to what we tried to do was um in terms of proteins for instance people would often uh take the protein recovery drink and then they've seen the data with the anthocyanin antioxidants from cherries, berries and the like, and they would take a um, cherry juice concentrate, for instance, with the protein gel. Sorry, with the protein um, yeah, drink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we figured, well, actually, these anthocyanins are, uh, tend to be in the skins of cherries and berries and the like, and you can get the cherry skins with these anthocyanins present maybe we could use that to provide the flavor as much as possible we combine that with the protein and we build it into one right so right. in a lot of ways you've built the marginal gains in yeah um, so whereas a lot of the more commercial companies you see what ha happens they um, between maybe the, the sports scientist or the, the nutritionist that's got the head in the scientific literature the, there's a marketing department and the accounting department <laughs> and uh, and they think well this maltodextrin is half the price of that one or this protein is half the price of that one yeah. um, the 90% of the difference for someone fueling for uh, the, the sport is just whether they've got the carbs in well we'll just give them sugar yeah, yeah. yeah. so to put the marginal gains in becomes um yeah, a little more costly yeah and you always have to you know, so you can think if, if someone's not as um you know keen uh, if, if performance is not their big dr driver yeah then um they go for more margin gains than marginal gains yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let's <laughs> there's a lot of cool things that, that that you said there tim that i sort of want to pick up on but one thing is what's the driver for people like a lot of people performance is the driver a lot of people like we see in endurance sports now and obviously you've come from quite a professional background you know you sounds like you know a lot of the companies develop from what you did with, with Saxo but we're, we're now getting a lot of what we'd call weekend warriors or amateur athletes that are going into endurance bit triathlon cycling running and they're looking for solutions right so where's the line like where should people be looking on sports nutrition and how should they, you know, is it... Okay, okay. I think I, I, I see where you're coming from there, I think. Yeah. Often we get this, um, well, I'm not riding the Tour de France. Do yeah. I really need yeah, all this, yeah. this yeah. technical stuff? Um, what I say is that maybe sometimes more so in that um, the, the closer you are to your, physiologi your physiological limits, yeah. probably the more you can benefit from the technical energy drinks and bars. Yeah. Now, so if you're struggling to keep up on your local club run or cycle ride or you just want to get the half wheel on your mates because that feels really good <laughs> um, then uh, a fueling strategy based on the technical products will help improve your performance yeah in some ways it might improve your health if you are trying to optimize your hydration relevant to your particular challenge for instance yeah mm. yeah Inter yeah because i mean that's where i think that's where people saw maybe five eight years ago especially in this region i think and we can speak about them goo were probably the first people into the market and people were like okay i'm at the bike shop goo this is you know i've, I've, I've spent my twenty thousand pounds on my bike i'm going to go really fast even though i've still got this gut and i'm going to get a load of those goos and i'm going to smash them down and there wasn't really that much knowledge or education around it and then obviously people weren't going any faster with it as well so there's this sort of fine line isn't there between performance athletes and and these people that just want to get into sport or endurance sports well i think those those are um well i think goo is a, a, a great product uh, of its time that no it's not it tastes like absolute well, shit <laughs> <And with>, um, <laughs> <laughs> salted caramel it oh. like, no, let's be honest it tastes and but this is you don't have to be nice to them tim because this is more by our market research me and tom will take the hit for this one mate <laughs> is that there is i think we have maybe close to 200 endurance clients yeah and i have i think about three of them that can use goo <laughs> 
it's Liter- true. It, it's true, mate. Okay, anyway, uh, we don't have to back uh, them out. T- 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 taste is a little bit of a nightmare because uh, <laughs> sometimes you... Sometimes you can give things. Uh, you're messing about with flavors and taste and things, and you, yeah. you, someone says that's far. Someone, oh, that's far too sweet. Yeah. And then you, you give them something that you know has got more sweetness or sweetness <laughs> in, and they think, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You're thinking, but let me let me go back to some of these these things. Yeah. I think those those kind of products that are based on um, very strong syrupy, um, they're basically very strong simple sugar solutions. They're great in the respect that they enable you to be sort of self-sufficient in carbohydrate for instance you can stick some of them in your back pocket and if you needed a carbohydrate energy boost you can take them yeah the downside is you really need to take them with a significant quantity of water yeah. otherwise you are producing a hypertonic solution and those really tr- strong glucose in- solutions tend to gastric empty very slowly yeah. and if you're not careful set up osmotic effects that start to maybe draw fluid in and you get um, un- un- uncomfortable when we were thinking on, on gels is, well, if you, um, if you need to consume something with water, we, why not just make an, an energy drink and do it in one? Yeah. Um, but the case is if you need to carry the, the carbohydrate, but you'd have to be very lucky for the time that you require an energy boost to coincide with a, a water station. Yeah, right. If yeah. Every, every, every time. Yeah. We figured if you could do this, maybe with the technology using the, the higher molecular weight carbohydrates, you could make something that for the same concentration has a less osmotic pressure and so it's a lot lighter on your stomach and easy to take. Yeah. So that's, uh, and the example, I think I've given that a, a few times while I've been over here in um, Dubai, is where um, cyclists especially may have experienced the, the effects of ice. Um, hypertonic solutions you know often guys will go out in the desert get lost uh, lost a little bit they're out a little bit longer than they expect and before they know it doors have fallen off think where are they doing creeping along eventually they see a a garage or something Uh, so they dive into the garage they've been in there snickers (laughs) two and a half minutes three snickers cream egg (laughs) cream egg two two cans of pop two cans of pop they haven't they've been in there (laughs) and it feels awesome at the time yeah yeah. and they get out the door they get on the bike and they feel woof yeah stomach's like lead what is going on um, and basically, the, those your regular pops and sodas usually about a seventeen percent simple sugar solution. Yeah. So those those are um, very hypertonic before you even throw in all that confectionery. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I suppose a bit of practical advice is, ideally, you take an extra energy gel on your rides. Yeah. So even if you intend to bring it back every time, yeah, yeah. that will get you out of a hole and um, back home. Yeah. Uh, if all's failed and you end up at that garage, a little bit of self-control. Yeah. So yeah. maybe the uh, the uh, more optimal solution would be to make 50-50 your uh, can of pop yeah. and water yeah. and save that confectionery for the next 10 miles or so with little bits at a time. Eating it slowly. And you, you would feel uh, a lot better than the, um, yeah. Once you've got over the euphoria of throwing that three and a half thousand kilocalories of confectionery down in two and a half minutes, I guess. <laughs> it's something that we see so often though, isn't it? Of people you think, okay, they're going out. I think more probably, no, actually here at Zad's, uh, al oh, sorry. Mate, yeah. Zad's, the other day I went out, I was training and I got someone set off at the same time as me. They must have just gone up the stick and gone straight to Zad's. I'd gone around, done a lap and I'd got back and they were sat in Zad's eating uh, one of those Zad's wraps, which is like a. You like them though, <laughs> mate. I'll have one. You like them every now and then. He likes I feel them, I need mate. a hit. <laughs> he but thinks that that's a secret. No more, know, no, more cycled no more than three times a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they've, they've cycled. What? Not even an hour. Yeah. Up a, a very easy road. Yeah. And they are just eating back everything that they've thought that they'd been. Like they, he's probably miscounted his calories by like a huge amount, and he's definitely gonna. Finish I don't think he's counting <laughs> calories, this guy. <laughs> mate. And I like, I almost went up to him and was like, "Tell me your theory behind this, because, you know, you're not even. Yeah. I'd understand if you were drinking like a sports drink, and you think you at least doing it right, but you're not even doing that. You're just sat here eating. You probably told your missus you went for a three-hour ride, and you actually you've done an hour. Yeah. And then you're gonna ride back down, and it's like, 
like you were saying, people don't think that sports nutrition is, they need it because it's for like the top, top professionals. But actually, they're probably the ones who need to understand it and use uh, it more oh, than I was, most. I, I, I was trying not to judge. Uh, sometimes it, it judge, mate. You should <laughs> judge. Oh, yeah. You're and way it, too. It's always uh, it sits whoa. on the it sits on the edge. Yeah, that's all good. It always depends on on people's objectives. The the, the problem is sometimes, and I, I do see this um, often. Years and years of doing training camps in in Mallorca, yeah. where um, get people out on on a ride, and same deal really. The, but the um, there's yeah, 20 miles down the road they stop at a cafe and it's not just a quick cup of coffee it's the but because there's cake and um yeah. ham and cheese uh croissants uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> every 20 or 30 miles they're, 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 they're doing this and then um so they do the mountain ride from cafe to cafe um and they, c- they c- come back and they've done a week's training camp and there's no change in the body mass index, maybe maybe even gone up again, <laughs> especially if they've gone a little off-piste in the evenings. Yeah. yeah. Um, but So you can do that. If, if the objective is a gastro tour of the island, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and I see the sa- same again with people racing, sometimes with triathlons, you know, yeah. you think, well, is this a race or a picnic? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things we try to do in sports nutrition is often it is giving things in measurable doses. Yeah. But it's also about giving the nutrition that you need in the minimum amount of calories in a, a way that you can. That's um, it. So, you know, oh, okay, my approach would be, well, why don't you use the technical um, nutrition? See, I'll ride around the mountain ride with um, probably uh, gels, not too many bars, because sometimes you eat the bars if you don't need them. Yeah. Whereas the gels, you tend to have a bit of a strategy on, and, and, and you drink, you get around, around the, the, the big ride and then maybe have a really, really good cake when you <laughs> get back, and maybe even a little beer or something, so we'll really think about the quality and really enjoy that, yeah. uh, and get a little bit of more training effect because you've got around the, the, the ride quicker, you've got more time to recover, yeah. and you've consumed less calories probably for more training effect. Mate, let's talk, we've, we've been sort of talking around it for a little bit here about quality you mentioned it before and one thing when you're talking about so the older days i always remember you know you got a little bit sick and they'd give you a bottle of lucasade something like that and you know we talk about uh we talk about sports supplements and we see them in shops and people will come in and they'll say i bought this one and it was half the price of that one but it's got this many calories in it what you guys have done is you've gone down the route of trying to keep your supplements shall we say as you you've and you used it before marginal gains for margin but you've kept them at a really high quality well, it's the, the, the primary objective is health and performance i mean it sometimes right. uh surprises me that people think you know that they'll buy the the uh, budget price protein from wherever yeah without thinking about where has that been and let yeah. me give you a, a, a for instance here is that um you know you, you can see that protein you know your protein powder it could either be um, a protein powder that's, that's been designed from the start to produce a, a whey protein where the, the protein is native, so it's not been damaged during the production process. Yeah. And that's the kind of uh, whey protein that, that, that we use. You get other proteins that you think they've been probably been milk products that have been bouncing around the world food market for however long yeah. that are then um someone picks up or oh, let's separate these into whey protein and then you, you don't know what really the, so what the, pro- the problem example, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the problem might be then that um in in your whey protein you you have got a reducing sugar or milk you have got a reducing sugar and you've got fats and protein wherever you have uh, a reducing sugar and a uh, protein you have the potential to co- uh, cause uh, um, end glycation end products so AGEs so quite an apt name really because these are the kind of things that age you right similar um, I think you probably might uh, uh, regard acrylamide you know in baked foods yeah and they try to have acrylamide reduction because it's so uh, linked with all kinds of uh, metabolic diseases diseases of aging yeah. yeah these aren't so much damaged proteins as damaging proteins right 
same deal as when you get damaged fats and sometimes it's a mistake when you sometimes people say oh it doesn't matter i can eat this um dodgy burger because i'm going to burn the calories off mm. whereas actually these fats and damaged proteins your body tries to use them as components of you yeah so you're building a more dodgy structure yeah but also the the the, the proteins or fats that are damaged set off a cascade of damage of free radical damage in the body yeah so imagine if you're you're consuming a protein for re recovery that's got a high AGE count then you're potentially adding you know you want you want to be fighting the free radicals and the, the oxidative stress from doing training and adapting to that not from the food and the supplements that you are hoping will build your adaptation right yeah so you are what you eat even more so especially with fats you know the, your body takes them and builds use them as structural components of you yeah right. so what are you looking for then if say whey protein a and and whey protein b is there um they don't tell you they have some weird certificates that you might see stamped on that you <coughs> don't really know what they mean you you can't really tell the difference but one is 10 dirhams one's 20 dirhams why how can you search and know why one yeah. is worth it and one isn't i think most most cases you probably do get what you pay for um, really? okay and look you know you don't you want to find a, a, a good reputable ma manufacturer i think if you um you find out if someone's using a native protein probably makes a, a lot of sense i think that's the best you can do now and sometimes you see these things where it can be misleading i remember back in uh our you know, back in a, a previous life, um, a protein manufacturer coming to us saying, and they're, they're giving us all the, you'll recognize the words that you see, it's, it's cold processed, micro filtered. Yeah. So we've <laughs> separated this with cold processed, micro filtered. And uh, we're saying, well, yeah, so, so they're saying it's not, so you're saying it's, there's no damaged proteins in here. No, no, any damaged proteins are ca captured in the, the filters. I say, well, yeah, but presumably it's still wet. And you're selling this powder. How do you get from the um, oh. this? You know, because it comes from milk that's wet. It's yeah. been. Dr oh, yeah. You, you, well, we spray dry it. So they spray dry it at what, 200 degrees. So you, you know. So sometimes, but they're telling you often um, a little bit of a fraction of the process, but not telling you the whole, whole story. story yeah. So, so this bit might be cold process, microfiltered. But yeah, we heat the hell out of it when we're drying it off <laughs> yeah, with no measure of the quality of the protein afterwards. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So sometimes it can be a little bit of a minefield. Yeah. And the, the more you know often, or the more you look, sometimes it gets a little bit more stressy. Maybe we could, uh, we could actually support you to do a whole documentary on uh, the processing of protein and I reckon it would rally up there on Netflix with Game Changers <laughs> because, I mean, it's just... But it's true though, isn't it? Like we're, you know, the, the certain things are defined in certain ways and you've just demonstrated there with one part of the process that, okay, that's fine, but then we're, we're, we're drying it on at this level. You know, often people don't tell you the whole story. Yeah. And it can be frustrating sometimes. You do have a vegan protein though. We do. Oh yeah, let's What's get into the that. the thought behind that? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have a personal interest. Uh, not so much because I'm I'm, I'm vegan. I'm not, I'm not a vegan, but I am allergic to milk. Uh, right. Yeah. So um, I don't get on with milk products. So we have um, a vegan alternative is always a, a, a safe one for, for me. So it wasn't for marketing purposes, it was for personal purposes. Well, it was for, uh, yeah, so obviously a, a personal interest. Um, and it's always, I think it's always good to have a, uh, to be able to move things around a, a, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. And I think um, often the vegan proteins can be more cost effective. I think I mean, I'm, I'm oh. not a, a great fan of soy these days, probably for yeah. uh, GMO and uh, uh, pesticide residues uh, yeah. more than uh, that, that, that I think that's you know you hear some nonsense about soy proteins yeah but um, sometimes whey is well sold over soy yeah um, and there's a whole load of funky studies that you can say oh yeah whey is superior to soy but they've been nicely well constructed I think to with the re result built into the experimental design right yeah so you can see that that um 
a, a lot of the times your uh, protein synthesis for instance is stimulated by leucine so your leucine is the main amino acid that's the yep. switch to, to trigger protein synthesis so if you can um, give a protein with sufficient rapidly absorbed leucine the leucine level rises and that adds a, a push to protein synthesis what you find is often there's sufficient um, leucine to do that in about 20 grams of, of whey but um, you need a little bit more soy you'd maybe need 25 grams of soy right so if, you, if you're doing an experiment and you want the whey protein to be better or then you give 20 you match for whey oh, protein okay. right whereas if you match for the leucine content you might get a different result okay and it, it actually might be more cost effective to take 25 grams of soy than 20 grams of whey yeah. right but so sometimes it, uh, it's good to mix these these thing, things up. Yeah. Um, uh, so I forgot. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But the the other thing we did with the vegan protein, we tried to keep it fairly simple, so it's hypoallergenic. So the, the two, you know, we could start to say, well, are we going to add? Um, we can make a case for adding extra leucine, yeah. or we can make a case for adding carnitine, maybe. But what we thought, let's keep this one simple, and then um, more people can take it, and then they can choose to trick it up if the if. So what when you were looking at building it, there's a there's a few different proteins you can use that are non-whey. So um, obviously soy would be one. Pea protein is quite big. Uh, what else can they use? Like there's some like cricket rice, proteins, rice protein, rice proteins. Well, I think the, the the great thing, the combination there is is rice and pea. Right. So you think often things like beans and rice yep. the combination in regular food will, if you're vegan, will give you a complete protein. So that will cover your all amino acids. Okay. So by using the, the combination of, you know, pea by itself isn't probably the, the, the best. Rice by itself isn't the best. But if you use the combination, and it's it probably not. Good. It gives you a decent spread of amino acids. So is that what you use in yours? So that's what we use in the, in the vegan one. So you basically just looked at what's the best and that's what we're going to use. Um, well, we had a really uh, did a whole load of interesting work with uh, chlorella protein, which was was my number one objective. But when it came to actually uh, uh, making this product, the company we, we, we were working with couldn't actually supply it. <laughs> so we did all the experiments. We did a lot of the experimentation work, and I still think that would be interesting. Uh, chlorella protein protein to to, wow. to use, but. Um, you know, and, and or uh, combination of chlorella, pea, and and, and rice. Yeah. But maybe, you know, maybe that's someone will go and do that now. Oh no! <laughs> let's <laughs> let's take it down a few notches. Hopefully, we've still got some people that are just generally interested in nutrition, listening okay. to us talking <laughs> about. Can I can, I, can, yeah. I, can I come back on the, the um, yeah. you know, you know about the, the guy that's done the, the hours right that is then yeah. Let's um, go back to that. Yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 this yeah, guy. yeah, this guy. This guy's good. In the cafe, three and a half thousand kilocalories. I think the, um, this is really a, a case linked to the proteins, why it's really a good idea to think about not just your pre-race nutrition, but your post-race nutrition. Yeah. If you've used a good quality recovery shake, yep. then the thinking's done for you. You can take, you know, start going through the boxes, what is important and how much do I need and work the numbers uh, with more regular food so you have a nutritional strategy. Yeah. If you've made your post-exercise recovery shake, it's in the fridge for when you get back home, you come back from your ride or your, your long run, you have your, your recovery shake, get changed, you're sorted. Yeah. There's a little bit of a danger when you come back and you've not made a strategy. Yeah. Because you come back, you're thirsty and you are hungry and you open the fridge door and think, ah, cheesecake, <laughs> trifle. Oh, you what's often, this? You have a lot of cheesecake in your fridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah often <laughs> has two gels and a bottle of water. Well, like that. okay, that, that's, that's that's safe. Good, good fridge management. Well, you know, if in the, the the family, the family's been out yeah. party last night, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but even if you've not done this, and you you well, okay, I'll have some toast. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you sat among the toaster and half a loaf later. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's true. You though, need yeah. to think. Oh, on mate, it's totally true. You, you see. You can do this. So uh, there's a little bit of danger there as well. Also fall into the sal salad trap. Yeah. You know, the, the salad trap they talk about for regular dieters where 
people often they have the salad for yeah. the lunch and then they feel really good so when they said uh, oh, dessert yeah they'll uh, have it yeah. they'll have it yeah. oh apple pie ice cream yeah oh, i was really good i only had the salad yeah. right yeah. um and then in the end they're not eating more calories than they would otherwise have done if yeah. they would made a different nutritional choice so you know your willpower might be low you're genuinely hungry and thirsty but before you know it you've had three and a half thousand kilocalories more than you really need yeah. uh, maybe you know, 1500 calories would have been fine. Yeah. Um, go shower, get, and then, um, and you've thought about your hydration, you've thought about providing sufficient protein for adaptation, not just fueling. Um, you've maybe got a little bit of antioxidant nutrition, maybe a little bit of the, the cherry anthocyanins, for instance. Yeah. It's, it's, it's totally true, though, mate. Like, because, I mean, I use it here, I use the, the, the vegan protein, and after we finish training in the afternoon, we come upstairs, we'll make a shake, we'll have a glass, we'll all have a glass of shake, and it's totally perfect, but everything's there, like we've, we've got the blender, we've got the ice, we've got some bananas, we'll add bananas into the protein, and it'll just be a good shake, and that's at maybe 3.30, 4 o'clock, and I'll have my dinner at 6.30. If I don't have that, Luckily at home, we don't have anything that's too bad, but I'm, I'm scratching around the kitchen, annoying Holly. She's like, get your fingers out of there and get your finger, because it's just about having this, this strategy in place, which in this case, fr fr from what you guys have, these recovery shakes is just something that's, it's so easy to have ready, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, you recover, your thinking's done for you. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, you know, that, that is the, the case for a lot of, of sports nutrition products and that it's clearly yeah. easy you know your grams of protein your grams of carbohydrate they're easy there the portion control yeah. you know you can do things with real food but sometimes a little bit difficult yeah you know the example i often give is if you think of um wine from the same grapes from the same vines in different years you've either got great vintages or less good vintages yeah and i often say well you don't want to be thinking on um when your next uh races I, I hope it's been a good year for the energy gel <laughs> um so you know we, we need these things to work uh, every time yeah uh, you know so when we do use things like um yeah we use organic fur trade bananas in our yeah. um uh, banana gels Tastes the, amazing. The, the, um mm. the process the peel on site so it's not it's not a concentrate so we peel on site wow. yeah. uh, processed in a vacuum packed off under nitrogen wow. um so it kind of locks a lot of the nutrition in there but when we buy these bananas, we, we, we have to, we're there with um, Alan back home's there with his ripeness chart. Really? To ch because the um, the composition of sugars in a banana will yes. change through how ripe it is, and often when a banana is ready for consuming during a race, it tends not to travel so well in your pocket. Yeah. Yeah, the ones that travel really well with loads of green in the skin, yeah. you tend to end up with more uh, resistant starch in there than yeah. readily available sugars. Yeah. So, you know, can be maybe useful as a, a snack to knock the edge off your appetite more than a useful fuel while you're out, out on the bike. Yeah. So you have those things to consider. Yeah. I think that's... that. The wine thing for me, mate, is, is summed, summed it up quite well. It's like, you know, you, you know with high quality products that and the consistency and that that's i mean that's what i've found is, is I've, I've used your products now for for a year and every time i take it i feel pretty much the same i get a very similar response and it's is just consistent which i think a lot of people going back to goo as well I hear a lot of people that are uh, this day it was all right but then this day yeah. and I'm, I'm not saying that they don't have consistency but it's just like sometimes they just can't stomach it but something that I think, yeah i think it's probably more to do with their hydration status and yeah. how much they've drunk yeah. along the, the but i've along never heard path. i've definitely never heard that with with, with with your products that people are struggling to to, to and, get them in and sometimes i i find it amusing sometimes that uh, someone's done a race and they had a little bit of a dodgy stomach or something and they always try and find one of the technical products to blame yeah, it's not yeah. the curry that they had the night before yeah, yeah <laughs> or yeah. or um or even that um you know, they've been chewing the handlebars for the last three hours, hanging yeah. on to a reel, turning themselves inside out to try and achieve a personal best. Yeah. Uh, and then wondering why their the stomach's a, 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 a little, little bit, bit shaky, twitchy yeah. or, or, you know, so sometimes you have to be a little bit realistic. Yeah. And then we the same thing, just to um, talk, I often have this about, cr you know, cramp often comes up when yeah, people are suffering right. cramp. And uh, my, my story, uh, my best story on cramp is, um, 
a number of years ago I think I was I was already already the wrong side of 40 and uh, the I was well happy that I managed to finish the national road race championships you know cycling with the professionals right. uh, in the and in the last group that did the full distance so 200 and odd kilometers wow. um, so I, I, but I was saying to one of my, my teammates I said who was in the break um, I was saying a bit sketchy though on that, that there was that big climb on the, the uh, from between the big circuit and the finishing circuit that big climb and I was cramping all over the place and my, my mate goes he said I, I should I should I should hope so this <laughs> is this is the national championship yeah, it's, right. it's not some Mickey Mouse um, you know circuit race club run whatever this yeah. is the now do, do yeah. you not do you not think we were cramping up in the break right yeah so if you are pushing yourself to your lim- you're exploring your limits yeah you maybe should expect things to be a little bit frayed at the edges yeah you know yeah. or maybe you're not trying hard enough that is so <laughs> true because so many people ask me how to how do I s- I've got a cramp how do I solve it it's yeah. the nutrition right and it's like no it's your muscle condition is not ready for the the stress you've put it under yeah so we could give you all sorts of nutrition it wouldn't solve your cramp like yeah and like you just said yeah, there, more, no I mean I've often that I've, I've um, yeah this comes up so I've been I thought it'd be great to do some wonderful cure-all and anti-cramp formula but I think it's not that often I've, I when, when people come back the first question I ask is you know is it sort of everywhere or is it one specific muscle? Yeah. You know, if it's one specific muscle, then maybe we sh- should send you to the physiotherapist first. Yeah. Because the um, maybe everything's right. You're adequately fueled. You're adequately hydrated. Yeah. It's just because you've got some kind of knot. It's yeah. not being delivered to, to that particular muscle. Yeah. Or you have you changed your running shoes or on the bicycle is your cleat. Something misplaced yeah. or are you overloading that one particular muscle in some way yeah. your risk factors for cramp tend to be previous history of cramp family history of cramp and, and trying hard yeah. which comes back <laughs> to, hard. to uh, not particularly helpful but beyond that yeah. you, you, it, it could be it could be just basically you're you're not fueled properly yeah. you're you're not hydrated any number of a number of vitamins uh, yeah. minerals sorry your b vitamins maybe um paper recently carnitine perhaps yeah but there's n- i don't think there's any magic uh, but you, you do get that and if t- people are, s- are suffering from cramp you sort of ask them okay did you do and everything looks pretty good and then it is down to what you said like you were trying really hard that day yeah it usually boils down to conditioning and the, yeah. the, the, you know so you think well yeah and and maybe if you've done all your training on the flat and suddenly you're on a yeah. hill so you're stressing different muscles yeah i mean there is a um there's a central theory of cramp where it's sort of i think the theory goes along the lines of all the the signals from your brain become backed up yeah and then are all delivered at once so yeah. your muscle goes into yeah, uh, spasm. A spasm yeah yeah uh, and if you take something to sort of shock your body via vagal nerve stimulation then you um can sort of work like a, a reset of your computer yeah you know you yeah. Have a hard reset yeah right. um and that's where you see those there's some drinks that are just either a very concentrated sodium solution or pickle juice even <laughs> you know i think maybe yeah. i said a few times this week that maybe a shot of tequila might might do the same <laughs> easy on the yeah. line <laughs> whoa <laughs> Same job. Yeah. There's something that, that gives you that, that, that shock the and that reset. Yeah. Yeah. Mate, super interesting stuff. And before we wrap up, obviously you guys you have a massive line out there. People go and check out. I'll put all the links in the show notes. I want to just get a little bit of an insight. And I know this is sort of a crystal ball question, but obviously you, you've built this thing pretty, pretty fast based on, on what you knew. Things are changing. People want to continue pushing what would limits their limits human endurance where what what direction will we see what products might we see from you guys in the next 18 months is there something is there something revolutionary coming or are we just sticking with doing the good things super well i think we've got a few ideas uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but often and often the, the challenge is, is difficult for me sometimes so often i've been doing quite a few few talks around yeah. um the, the the city this week and it's still the important things are doing the basics right yeah and sometimes yeah. It, for me it can be quite hard because you think oh am i telling the same information but the first things first is is is, is 
planning your nutrition, having a sensible nutrition plan, yeah. not doing anything too crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, frustrating things sometimes you start to see many um, result studies where the results are built built into the the, the design of the study. Yeah. That can be a little bit frustrating and. Uh, yeah, but what's new that I can tell you about? Uh, what? Cause <laughs> something that is kind of similar boat to us is we don't invent any new training, but we we do the basics very well, and then we also sort of live through it. So we we tell our training story because we go out and do events. We go out. It's a bit easier for us maybe than a, a nutrition company. But have you had any ideas to? Have you got a team in the UK at the moment? Are you pushing behind ideas of people doing? amazing endurance feats or helping teams to achieve things because then secret training is obviously the staple of what they can do but you're showing what your product can help people do well i think that this is great to work with um some of the pro tour teams whether they're well monitored but i always think it's always really important to put your own head on the block from time to time yeah so um we try and do as much sport our, ourselves and at least so you know what the sensations are like if you have to do a five-hour ride around Mount Tidy, for instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so we, we've done those kind of rides and we, we continue to do so. And, yeah, forever there's always new formulations being passed out to um, friends and our, our little domestic team back home. Yeah. So what's your goals next year? For me? Um, well, I think I've said that... Um, the w World Masters Track Championships is, is in yeah. Manchester <laughs> for the last, I think, for the and then it moves on. Yeah. So I should probably have another go at that because the World Masters, I think I've been second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and, and different combinations in different uh, disciplines. I, I want what but the guy who's first is taking me. <laughs> <laughs> ne never quite managed that. Uh, it, uh, it would be good to be able to go and finish that project off. Yeah. Um, although, yeah. you know, I seem to have a habit of falling off before that. <laughs> so, so maybe my first objective should be stay to upright. Um, stay upright until October. Um, the other thing is I've ended up doing a little bit more cyclocross um, because my daughter has taken up and has a real fondness for cyclocross, which she seems to be able to do quite well. Yeah. And maybe I, I'd like to get good enough so she stops being able to say, but daddy, you suck at cyclocross. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> what a way to finish. Tim Lawson, mate, absolute legend. Loads of really good information there, mate. And, of course, people, go and check out the site. I'll put it in the show notes. Thank you for being with us in Dubai, and thank you for bringing such great products to us. Thank you for having us here. Awesome. Thanks a lot.